Okay, what's going on, you mystical nerds? <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'm, I mean, I'm the one who's reviewing these books, so, you know. <laughs> so today, I am reviewing the second of the Robert Monroe books. I already made a video reviewing the first, his Journeys Out of the Body book, and I'm going to make one more after this about his third book, The Ultimate Journey. Um, but just talking about, you know, out-of-body experiences, whether they're, re whether they're real or not, got that one out, whether they're real or not, and uh, yeah, so reviewing the second book today. This is, this book, the second book, uh, oh... Yeah. There's like a large portion of this book that I I just I didn't even know what to do with because it didn't feel like I was reading a non-fiction, you know, documentary type book. It felt like I was reading a science fiction book. Non-fiction and fiction. Non non-fiction is the real one. Fiction is the fake one. Yeah, science fiction. I always get those two confused. Ah, damn it. Okay, so I'm just going to go through this book and, you know, I highlighted some points in here. Or I didn't highlight. Dog-eared. Dog-eared. This, you know, this guy right here. Did that a whole bunch. And uh, just going to talk about some main points. Some really just some things I learned. Even through all the crazy absurdities in this book there's still some things that i find very interesting in a way that it's like this could be possible based on things that i have even experienced and i'm willing to bet things that even you have experienced so stick around for that because that should be interesting to hear your thoughts on that down in the comments but uh yeah i'm just gonna go go through it and you know, share these different things that I learned. So, where am I going to start? What is this first dog here? What what is what chapter is this? What is going on right now? I'm so prepared for this video, guys. Okay, so he starts off the book. Uh, what is this? Like the first chapter, first or second chapter? Second chapter, uh, talking about this hemisync process. Now, a lot of people know this similar process as binary beats, uh, which is you have a frequency in this ear, you have a frequency in this ear, and say this frequency is 100 hertz, this frequency is 125 hertz, your brain will then sink, sink to a frequency of 25 hertz. And there's different levels of brain frequencies that can, once your two hemispheres uh, brain hemispheres are synced up to these frequencies, it can produce altered states of consciousness or all these, uh, all sorts of different stuff that Robert Monroe figured out through his research. I did a little bit more research on this outside of this book, and he actually didn't invent binary beats, but he was the first, uh, Robert Monroe was the first to experiment with their effects on consciousness. Maybe I can put a link in the description to some Google searches, but he talks about the hemisync uh, process, hemisync for short, but it's hemispheric synchronization. So this book starts out talking about the hemisync process and then goes into his experiments inside of his foundation, the Robert Monroe Institute, where he explores you know, consciousness. He had a bunch of volunteers come in. They're volunteers, but they're also doctors, scientists, uh, PhD, psychiatrists, you know, just a whole bunch of other people doing these experiments. And it's really weird because in these experiments, these earlier on experiments that they did, they searched the universe for extraterrestrial life, basically, but they didn't find any sense of life or energies or entities, whatever you want to call them until they started exploring other dimensions uh, outside of space and time. And he talks about how out-of-body experiences, uh, it, and he even has a couple accounts in here of, you know, he looked at the clock before he went out of body. He had an experience that felt like 10, 12 hours. He came back in body, looked at the clock, and it was only like eight minutes later or something crazy like that. So he talks about the time difference in the things that he experienced as well. Um, but anyway, from these people that volunteered for these experiments it's it sounds like possession happened and he puts it in a very uh, it's not the possession that people when they think about being possessed by like demons think about but these people allowed themselves to be taken over by these entities that they met out and wherever it was 
and these things started to speak through them. Uh, and Robert Monroe asked them questions and they told him all this stuff. Like I said, it's like science fiction stuff. So that's why I'm like, I don't know about this stuff. But this is this is very interesting. This one encounter that this uh, specific person had, uh, this was what was speaking through that person. And this is in chapter 5, page 60. This is very interesting. So as I talked about in the last book, he goes back and forth whether or not God actually exists. He said he has these encounters where it sounds like mystical experiences. And then he says, but then I realize that God isn't real. And then now he comes back to even these very, like what I'm about to read to you sounds like something straight from the book of like Isaiah or like the New Testament. So uh, page 60, chapter five. It said, Blessed are, the, are they who seek me, and seeking me, their long period of forgetfulness is coming to an end. They are awaking to who they truly are, a living part of me, manifesting life and radiating love. You have forgotten to look for me, much less gaze upon my countenance. O ye of little faith, there are countless numbers who live in the expectancy of my coming. In truth, I never left. And he goes on and on for two pages. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there's parts that say, I'm the light that guides all men to the Father. I am the love that overcometh all things. I am the light that illumines the minds of men. I am the substance of men's souls. I am the life and you are my own. I am the very breath you breathe. We are one in the Father. Like, that literally sounds like John 14 when Jesus is speaking or praying aloud to the disciples. Very interesting. And this thing, this monologue, whatever you want to call it, is just in there. And he doesn't even address how it sounds, which I also find very interesting. So another interesting, very interesting point that I want to point out is found in chapter six. And again, do with do with all this what you will. Just some other interesting things that I found in the book that I want to share. Uh, at the beginning of chapter six, he says, all humans move into the out of body state during sleep going falling dropping asleep is simply a process of moving out of phase with physical time space so he believes in the first book he was questioning but now in the second book he very much believes that all humans when we are asleep we don't remember it but we travel out of body when we are asleep when we travel out of body when we sleep where do we go? What do we do? Well, apparently there is a thing somewhere out in the universe in an interdimensional whatever called the sleepers class. Now this is very interesting. Let me let me read to you this this part that I doggy eared and underlined and starred. <laughs> I'm so weird. It's great. So when we fall asleep, we go into this class, and I'll explain why there's a class uh, later on, or he explains it, and I'll just tell you what I read. Um, but he says sleepers classes attended by countless humans during a portion of their deep sleep during the sleeping out of body period the only limitation that such sleep could not be distorted by chemicals it has to be natural uh how many times i had been there uh been here long before i knew it before i knew anything about ob o o b e's and the like, I just didn't remember when I woke up. Like everyone else, if anything leaked through, it was attributed to a dream, inspiration, idea, or imagination. So he goes deeper into these, these, these lessons that he learned in school. And they are a lot like dreams. They sound exactly like dreams. Um, he said that he would just be like hooked up into this thing. I, it, very weird but hooked up into this thing and then he would go into a different state of consciousness and he would experience these things that would ultimately teach him lessons that he needed to learn to evolve in life um, and so a lot of these dream a lot of these lessons that he had really looked like dreams and I know that I, maybe this is confirmation bias I don't know I'm not saying that I believe that this is the case I'm saying it's a possibility based on I know that I have had dreams, or what I attribute to dreams, um, possibly, 
and I have woken up with some revelation or some lesson that I learned that I don't know where it came from. I mean, it could have very well come from weeks ago and my consciousness just brought it up and then I just realized it. I don't know. You know, any of this, these things are possible. But I do know that there are dreams that I've had, like I've said, that sound exactly like this. That is like, I learned something in the dream. I woke up with some sort of revelation, with some something changed in me. And he even talks about how if you don't learn the lesson when you take it, when you have this dreamlike state and you're learning the lesson, you're in this experience, it will happen time and time and time and time again until you learn that lesson, which could also maybe possibly explain reoccurring dreams to some people, that there is a lesson that they need to learn in life, but they haven't been able to learn it yet or they haven't passed the test in this sleeper class. And uh, so the dream or the class, the lesson has it's, is reoccurring until they can learn it. So. Just found that interesting. Do with that what you will. And so, uh, what is this? This is like halfway through the book now. Um, he talks about when traveling all these different places. I mean, he, all these things that he's learned, all this crazy stuff. This is the first time that this subject comes up. Um, he discovers or uh, evaluates or sees people in the whole concept of reincarnation. Uh, happens where people can choose to come back to earth because they haven't yet learned all the lessons that they need um, to graduate um, which is like you know you come to earth you come to this school where you learn how to be a human you learn how to love because you you don't have any concept of that when you are some sort of interdimensional being before you're a human being I know this all sounds insane I know how it sounds <laughs> Trust me. Um, I'm just telling you what I'm reading. Um, and then it's like, where do these people go when they graduate? Where do they go when, they le when they've learned all the lessons that they learned? Uh, then it says, they make one more cycle, um, one more physical life as a human, and then they're gone. Uh, saying that, you know, in talking about reincarnation, they do these life cycles. And then when they're evolved enough and they're on these outer rings... I won't get into that. Again, buy the book. If if this doesn't sound like insane stuff to you, buy the book. It's a very interesting read. I do think there's some good nuggets in there. Um, some interesting things. But uh, then he says, you know, where do they go once they graduate? And they say, and they say, I don't know. Home, I guess. And that's the first time I think that home is mentioned. And what is home? Where is home? It's kind of, but not really, addressed in the third book, um, but it's not addressed in the third book. You don't really find out where home is actually. You don't find out, he never finds out in any of the three books where that, I mean, you think you find it in the um, third book, the final book, but then you finish that book and you're like, but this didn't really answer anything. So, all right, moving right along now. Oh, this is this is great. This is I'm just uh, all right. So I'm just going to briefly go over this story. But this, I mean, this, I this is the thing. This is what did it for me. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> I have no idea. This is very interesting. So apparently, there is a history of humanity that he discovered how humans came into being and came into existence. And it's this thing where. Literally, it says someone, capital S, somewhere requires, likes, needs, values, collects, drink, eats, or uses as a drug a substance that is identified as louche. And later on, he talks about this substance is love. It's an energy that is love. And this someone somewhere needs it to survive. And so it talks about how he made a garden, which to me sounded a lot like the Garden of Eden. He made a garden and he started making these, uh, I mean, I don't, I think they refer to it as plants and then they turned into mobiles, you know, moving things. Um, and then he found a way to create a system to where he could create this energy of love that is what he needed and his home needed to survive. I know, I, I know, I know. Try to hang in there with me. Uh, and then he decided, what if I put a part of myself 
into one of these things, one of these mobiles, as he called it. And then he discovered that when he put a part of himself into this and then gave that mobile, gave that human being, person, whatever, a partner, then they were able to create this loose love energy on their own and he left them be and he came back whenever he needed this energy of louche or love and collected it brought it back home and it was just like we were just this sick science experiment and we have been used and then in the 13th chapter page 173 um, he states again, something was dying in me. I had long realized that the God of my childhood did not exist, at least not in the form and substance envisioned by my incul in in enculturation. Man, I am an idiot. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there's that. Oh, man, do with that what you will. But, okay, here. On the bright side. All right, here's a little nugget for you that's not super weird. Uh, page 175. He says, uh, he starts talking about love. So he meets with this uh, other being and he starts talking about how he's crushed by the realization of what could possibly be the history of humanity and how we came to be. Which, you know, I keep reading the book and I read the whole third book and that whole story kind of falls apart. Like it doesn't, it doesn't actually add up or make any sense in the coherent you know, looking at books one, two, and three, and how they're all lined up, that doesn't that story doesn't make any sense, and it just doesn't really work with everything else that he says. Um, but he's, they start talking about love, and he starts talking about the illusion of our reality and our experiences and our emotions and all of that. But then he says, uh, for love, he's like, but you know it exists. Love is not an illusion, which really got me thinking, which really kind of planted a seed of thought in me. Um, that's very, very cool to think about. That how many things in life, like our emotions, like you know, possible reality, uh, uh, the simulation theory, all of that. You know, if that is the case, how much of all of this stuff is illusion? But that love, love is not an illusion. Love is something to be learned and understood, which is the reason why people come to Earth to learn how to love, uh, because apparently that's something that can only be done in the time-space continuum. Again, man, I know. I'm. It's like a science fiction novel. I, I don't know what to take from it, what to do, but... Help. Another interesting thing, just as I'm sharing all this stuff, there's also stories in this talking about people who have died that he has seen on Earth that are unwilling to accept that they've actually died. And so they try to live life on Earth as they have lived. And, and they, they're like, everybody's ignoring me. Nobody can hear me. It's like I'm not even here. But they continue to live life on Earth trying to be human because they're unwilling to accept the fact that they've died. And so I'm like, well, I guess there's there's the concept, the whole concept of ghosts and haunting. I guess it's just people unwilling to accept that they've died. Yeah, all that good stuff. Uh, so, yeah, super interesting. Oh, very interesting. Page 199. He finds a church in the afterlife. Yeah, he finds a church with a preacher preaching about heaven. Interesting thing is, that is the other spot where they mention home. It's just an observation, you know. That is the other place in this book where they mention uh, going home and graduating. I mean, he goes through this whole dialogue with this woman uh, talking about, you know, it, this is this heaven? Isn't this where God is? And she says, no, but we can take you there. Our, you know, pastor preaches these sermons and then afterwards people go, you know, he's like, where do they go? And she's like, I don't actually know. Same as the person before that talked about going home. They said, I don't know where they go. They go home. Um, and so he ends that conversation saying, see you in heaven, I hope. So again, he's going back and forth. He's uh, at first in the first book, you know, he said, God, maybe God exists. And then he gets crushed. And then in this, he says, well, maybe this is proof that there's God. And then he gets crushed. And now he meets this church in the afterlife that they send people to heaven. And now he's, you know, see you in heaven, I hope. So, I mean, he just goes back and forth the whole time. He never lands at an actual place saying, yeah, this is exactly where, uh, you know, this this is exactly what heaven and God is. And he, he doesn't find any of that. Uh, so, 
Another uh, fun little nugget, fun little fact on page 203. So basically, this interdimensional being, this energy entity, whatever, that he has named BB. I know. Uh, could have come up with a better name. I don't I don't get it. But BB. So uh, he explains to BB, he's trying to explain explain to him how to be human, what it means to be human, because this BB character has absolutely no idea what is pain, what is pleasure, what is emotion, what is time, what is warm, hot, cold. He doesn't understand any of it, and he doesn't get any point of being human, or like he is like a child, like a child in the most innocent sense and arrogant sense in some ways, in my opinion. Um, but he's trying to explain to BB what it means to be human. And then he explains it like a game. And then he says that the emotions are the point of the game. The emotions are the point system of the game. Which I also, that planted a seed in me, which really got me thinking too. But then he goes on and uh, he says, Emotion is what makes the game seem so wild. But it is the game, the one game in which all other games are played. The others feed score to the big game in the form of emotional energy. The big, game, the big game is to control and develop this emotional energy to its most effective condition, which is vaguely set by us humans as love until we graduate. So, apparently the goal of this school, like I said, and this whole Earth life, life system, is to learn to love. And, you know, the emotions are the point system to dis to tell us where we are at in that, which, you know, there's some issues there, but it's interesting to think about emotions as a point system in life. I won't get into that and my thoughts on that, but I do think there could be some truth to that um, outside of all of this possible science fiction stuff. So, and I'm not trying to, like, be weird about it or, like, say that this isn't the case or this isn't real. But at the same time, I'm like, this is not making it easy on people to actually believe this stuff. Telling stories like, yes, I know exactly how humans came into existence. And then talking about, you know, it just doesn't, I don't know. To me, it's not like, I, I learned a lot more in the first book and in the third book. This second book was pretty hard for me to get through. But I digress and I move on. One last uh, point here, or a couple, two last points here. Um, something I underlined, page 248 says, We go to physical because of what it is, an intense learning process, a school of a very unusual sort. Now, it's the... Okay, oh my god. All right, my head's spinning again. I don't like this book. <laughs> I like it, but I don't like it. The, the concept of heaven and hell does not make as much sense as this does, as this whole process of learning through life, that we come to earth as it's like a school that teaches us how to evolve so that we can graduate and go home. Whatever that means, that makes a bit more sense, to me at least, that, you know, there's this, yeah, all this crazy theology in heaven and hell, and maybe even possibly um, you know, coming to Earth, may, if, if, if any of that is true. You know what, I'll just say this. Despite what is true, thinking about if there is an afterlife, if we did exist before this life, whatever, if we've lived multiple lives, whatever the case may be, it makes complete sense to me, and I do like the philosophy of it, whether it's real or, real or not, I don't know, even though there's, you know, the encounters of the dreams that I've had, which is a possibility of the sleeper school. I do like the philosophy of this life being a school, because I do think I have witnessed that, that the most valuable things in life that you can learn, that I have learned, is the lessons that we've learned is the is the most precious is the most valuable the wisdom that we gain the experiences that we carry because that's what apparently that's what make us a, a graduate that's what that's what evolves us as a human right and so i, I do think and you know graduate non-graduate heaven home whatever um I, I do i do hold that a value that that this place is a learning system this is a story taking place and that we can have these lessons and this this is what counts this is what's valuable and it's the lessons and learning about love because apparently we can't learn what love is 
um, unless we're in the space-time continuum, which to me kind of sounds like a beautiful thing. But again, I'm, this is just my observations, and you know, this book is kind of woo. Okay. Okay. So, very last point, uh, page two fifty. It says a third form of learning occurs during our uh, cyclic non-conscious state, which is sleep. Cyclic. I'm pretty sure I got that right. Sly, cyclic. <laughs> At our waking conscious level, we remember very little of such activity, although it becomes deeply embedded in and becomes a part of the memory experience system upon which we obs we base our life activity. That again, I mean, it just it maybe in you know maybe there's some confirmation bias there of me just knowing how much I've learned from my 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 dreams my dream state i'm a very active dreamer and i do think whatever dreams are i do learn a lot from them um i've learned some very interesting and valuable lessons from them actually uh so yeah this book uh overall you know if you've made it through this video congratulations um, very interesting, very, in, very interesting stuff indeed. So out of the three books, I would recommend this one the least, um, unless you're like totally into reading some crazy, uh, you know, possible conspiracy theories and more like a science fiction novel that the writer claims is nonfiction, is the real deal. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, go ahead and pick this book up. Very interesting book indeed. Probably won't read it again, but I do like the, f the, first thir the first book and the third book. So yeah, I do think there's some interesting points in this book. There's some interesting takeaways. Um, there, it gives you a lot to think about. Uh, it, and it gave me a lot to think about as I read this book. Gave me, a, I felt very existential um, I think that I can put it that way when I was reading this book, uh, meaning that I, I, like I said, I just didn't know what was up, what was down. And I didn't know, you know, if he is telling the truth, which I'm very open to it. Um, it, to me, it just sounds like complete and other kind of nonsense right now. But again, I mean, the thing I appreciate about him so much is that he says, you know, if you don't believe any of this, experience it for yourself. Um, and then you'll find out. So, you know, the people that have experienced it have said even crazier things than what he says in this book, believe it or not. So, yeah, it, I don't really know what to think uh, about the end of this third book. I would not recommend reading this book alone. If you're going to read this book, read the first book, this book, and the third book. The, reading this book alone, I think, would just mess you up and really confuse you. Um, so I am very glad that I read the trilogy, uh, all three of them. There's, that's, that's my review on this book. Very skeptical even still. Uh, the third book, I'll, you know, make my final video on that. But really cleared things up for me and enjoyed it a lot more. I cleared things up, but I... I cleared things up but didn't totally like obviously I didn't find all the answers in this book obviously this book doesn't can these books don't contain all the answers but I do think they're these books contain some truths that I think they're very important to think about and that we should think about them as far as the rest of the other stuff you know still thinking about that still waiting to have an experience of my own to where I can compare these stories to something um, I've had plenty of lucid dreaming experience. I've actually had one experience where uh, it happened years ago that I won't really get into talking about in this video, but it did feel like when I came to, whether it was waking up, coming to, I don't know, it felt like this world was a simulation, this world was a video game, and that where I was was the real deal. And now a lot of people that have experienced out-of-body experiences, um, and he even talks about it at the very end of this book. He has these questions, and I think I'll address them in the next video. Um, but one of his most asked questions is how do you know the difference between an out-of-body state and dreaming? And he addresses that. So I'll talk about that in the next video. Um, but yeah, I, you know, not knowing, not, the people that experience out-of-body say, you know, it feels more real than reality itself, which, you know, that's a very paradoxical, contradictory sentence. But um, I've experienced kind of that, and I don't really know what to do with it because it only lasted like four or five seconds, but Again, won't really get into that in this video, but that is my review of you know uh, the Far Journeys book. Dropping that, putting that down, 
Thank goodness it's over with. <laughs> All right, so if you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share. And uh, feel free to check out my podcast. I haven't mentioned it enough on this channel, uh, but it's the Philosophical Misfit Podcast. So go check it out. Uh, Apple, Spotify, whatever streaming platform of choice. Um, and yeah, so check that out. And I will make a video next week on this final book, The Ultimate Journey, uh, which will be a lot more enjoyable to talk about than this second book. So, uh, yeah, I will see you there. Peace. I got that summer.